Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Thank you, ladies, and thank you, Harvard Hill ladies as well, for the special musics. Uh, it's a blessing. I want to welcome the students from Harvard Hills. I hope you had a wonderful time at Messiah's Mansion. I believe you went or you're going today, something like that. So going today, okay. So welcome to Wildwood. We're grateful to have you here. I want to welcome those that are visiting with us. I know we have medical observers. I'm not sure we have any lifestyle guests present with us. But uh, also I see some faces that are visiting. Uh, Kathleen, our former student, is there in the back with her husband, Niall. I want to welcome you as well. And those that are watching online as well, we want to say welcome. Um, this morning, as you see on the screen there, we are actually in the middle of a three-part series on the 144,000. But before we begin, I'm going to invite you, where possible, to kneel with me, or if you want, you can bow your heads, but I will kneel and pray as we begin. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Lord, you know the thoughts and the intents of every heart that is in this room. And because of that, Lord, you are the only one that is able to speak to each one. And so, Lord, we come before you pleading that you would help us, O oh God, to have hearts that are open to hear your voice and that the sweet spirit of yours would be able to not only comfort but convict us and to bring us to that place where truly we would be your servants. We thank you for such a wonderful privilege to, to have Christ. And even now, Lord, as the minds of many are turned to the death, uh, the life, death, and the resurrection of Christ across this country and across the world, we pray that we may be searching and asking ourselves, why the life, why the death, why the resurrection, and what is next in that sequence? And so we thank you. And we anticipate that you will be able to speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I am fascinated by Adventist history. And as such, I was looking at uh, a historical paper, just learning how a group of 50 faithful individuals were able to be used by God to raise up what is now uh, a 20-something plus million movement. And I found a very interesting statement that was written in this historical piece. It was commenting on Adventism. This was written by, uh, I think it's called Damstig. He says, Today, although ministers preach about the, min the mark of the beast, relatively little attention seems to be paid to the question, what is the seal of God? As life continues, or as usual, from day to day, scarcely any attention is paid to the seal of God. By contrast, nearly 100 years ago, Ellen G. White called special attention to its importance. And I'm going to put the, the, the quote that he's going to quote now. She wrote, uh, fact, let me read it there, The time has come when all who have an interest in their soul's salvation should earnestly and solemnly inquire, now notice three things, what is the seal of God? And what is the mark of the beast? How can we avoid receiving it? And this was in 1899, where she's saying, look, the people that are serious about their soul salvation, you should be asking, what is the seal of God? What is the mark of the beast? And how can I avoid the mark of the beast? And so it says, a century ago, believers felt that understanding the seal of God was a matter of life and death. They realized that only those receiving the seal of the living God will pass through the time of trouble and the seven last plagues successfully. Only the sealed ones will stand in the day of the Lord. And to understand this subject was a top priority for that little group that, that God raised to, uh, to start this movement. And my prayer is that even as we continue our study, we also would be concerned and would have this desire for what or how is it with my soul and the Lord. Now, if you have your Bibles, which I hope you brought a Bible to church, turn with me to Revelation, the seventh chapter. 
We are going to read again verse 1 to verse 3. We read it last time. So the first part we looked at, who are the 144,000? Today we are looking at, am I a part of the 144,000? And the final part, in a few weeks, we will look at the servants, the, blo- the broken blueprint. And um, so Revelation chapter 7, we are reading verse, verse 1 to 3. Notice the Bible reads, after these things, I saw what? Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. You heard Brother Xavier share the children's story about the storm when they were camping. Well, the Bible says this is a storm like no other storm before. This is not one where it's just a little lightning and, you know, everything is is fine. This is a serious storm. But notice, do not miss the fact that the angels are holding back the winds of strife. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And again, I want you to notice that there is this request. We need to wait until we have sealed who? The servants of our God in their foreheads. I have a friend of mine called Miss Carolyn. Miss Carolyn loves everything to do with angels. Whenever we study any topic we study, if you mention angels in there, she's happy. So this is the sort of passage that brings joy to her heart because she can see the ministry of angels in holding back those winds of strife. But notice that the angel has the seal of the living God. And I want you to go to John chapter 4 and verse 23. John chapter 4, verse 23, these are the words of Christ to the woman at the well. John chapter 4, verse 23, and as you think of a seal, a seal is a mark of privacy, a mark of genuineness, a mark of authentication. This is what the angel has. He has the the mark of authentication of the living God. Notice as Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, uh, John chapter 4, verse 23, It says, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father does what? Seeketh such to worship him. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus is saying to this woman at the well. Jesus was saying, look, the time is coming where God is not necessarily looking for packed churches. God is simply looking for true worshipers that will worship him in spirit, and in truth. That is the one desire the Lord has. Now, of course, God would love for a packed church with true worshipers. What do you say? Amen. So notice that God is seeking true worshipers, and God has a seal that needs to be placed on a people. Now, we are going to look at a parallel passage. Now, this is simply another passage that speaks on the same topic, And this is found in Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. So if you go to the Old Testament, uh, after Jeremiah, you have Lamentations, then you have Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. And this is a passage that's going to speak on this issue of the sealing, a sealing that's taking place. Ezekiel, chapter 9. I'm going to start it in verse 1, but verse 4 is the one that we want to pay attention to particularly. The Bible reads... He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth towards the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed with linen, and with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar." And the glory of of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was, to the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with ink, with linen, sorry, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. So get the picture. You've been told there are six men, each has a slaughter weapon. And they're coming, they're standing there, 
But then verse 3, we're told that a, a specific call is made to the one with linen who has an ink one. Now notice verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Now notice, set what? A mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now, I want you to notice what is going on. There is a mark that is being put on the foreheads of some people. Revelation chapter 7, there is a seal that is being put in the foreheads of God's servants. Now, what is interesting is, is the same thing. A sealing is taking place, and it's the same consequence as well. Destruction is coming. So I want you to notice that destruction is coming, but before destruction can come, God says, Wait. I have to seal my people, or I have to put a mark on my people. And friends, I simply want you to see the depths of God's love on display. That God would hold back destruction until he has sealed the people. That God says, I will not let that thing come until I know they're ready. That is the love of God. At the same time, we need to realize that God is not waiting for the Pope. God is not waiting for the President of the United States to do something. God is not waiting for all these things. God is waiting for a people that will be ready. That is what God is waiting for. So oftentimes we think we're waiting for God, but God is waiting for us. Now go back to Revelation. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 7 again, real closely, verse 3. Revelation chapter 7. I want you to notice again, the Bible reads, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, I want you to notice the primary function of the seal is to protect. Because God is saying, do not unleash destruction until I have sealed. My brothers and sisters, God is looking to protect a people from the storms that are about to come upon us. And I want you to see that a seal in its primary function is to protect. Go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew, the 27th chapter. We're going to look at verse 60, 62 to 66 as our first example. So we are looking at a seal. The purpose of a seal is to protect. Matthew 27, notice verse 62. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command therefore that the sepulcher or the grave be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people he is risen from the dead, so that the last error shall be worse than the first. Now notice, what is it that they wanted? Okay, they wanted that tomb to be made sure, basically no one can go in, no one can come out. Then notice verse 65, Pilate said unto them, You have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. Now, they're going to make it as sure as you can. Notice verse 66. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing it, sealing the stone, and setting a watch. So notice how they made it sure, how they made it in, impenetrable. They put a seal upon the stone. And then they, to double it up, they put a watch on it as well. So that's one example. Go to Daniel chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 17. The book of Daniel. Chapter 6, verse 17. Again, keep in mind the primary function of a seal is to protect. Daniel, chapter 6, verse 17. I want you to notice this is after Daniel has been uh, condemned to go in the lion's den. It says, And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords. Now, notice the reason why that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. The Amplified Version says that there might be no change of purpose concerning Daniel. Once it's sealed, there's no turning back. Now, does that make sense to anyone? 
The purpose of the seal is protective, protection. Now, with this in mind, go to Exodus chapter 31. We're going to look at verse 13. Keep in mind, seal, the Bible uses seal and sign interchangeably. So seal, sign, protection, okay? Exodus 31. And we are going to read verse 13. When you're there, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep. For it is a what? Sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth what? Sanctify you. So notice now, my Sabbath, it is a sign. Now remember, sign seal is being used interchangeably in the Bible. Now, if a seal is to protect, finish the sentence for me. What is the Sabbath to do? Okay. Give me the same words I'm using. Okay, to protect. So a seal is to protect. God gives a Sabbath, and God says, that's my sign or my seal. Now, go to, let's, let's read another witness, Ezekiel. Chapter 20 and verse 12. Again, just keep in mind, a seal primary function is to protect. The Sabbath is a sign or a seal. Let's see what we learn about that. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12. God repeats something. It says, Moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know I am the Lord that doth sanctify them. So I want you to notice, the Sabbath, God says, I gave them my sign between me and you, that I am the one who sanctifies you. Now the question then becomes to me, why would a holy God give you and I a weekly reminder that he is the one who sanctifies us? So imagine every seven days, we have a sign that God is saying to remind you that I am the one who sanctifies you. And keep in mind, a seal or a sign is for protection. Is it possible that God is trying to protect you and I from departing from the position that it is God that makes us holy? Is it possible that every week we need a reminder? That God says, I am the one who sanctifies you. So notice, one of the greatest dangers, my brothers and sisters, is the danger to change the narrative of the gospel. To bring a gospel that says, do this, and then, basically, you will be saved. The primary function, God says, the first thing you need to understand is you cannot save yourself. You cannot make yourself holy. The first step, God says, believe me. As you believe me, I will take care of whatever else is next. Now, I want you to notice this statement. Then I'll, I'll make a comment on the Sabbath. Uh, okay, we, we kind of missed that. This is Christ's Object Lessons, 97, paragraph 1. No mere external change is sufficient to bring us into harmony with God. No mere external change is sufficient, Okay. There are many who try to reform by correcting this or that bad habit, and they hope in this way to become Christians, but they are beginning in the wrong place. Our first work is with the heart. Now, again, they are being sealed in their foreheads. We are being told the first work is with the heart, with the mind. Proverbs 4.23, out of the heart or out of the mind are the issues of life. Now, notice this now. Because the Sabbath is the seal that we cannot make ourselves holy, true Sabbath keeping must be transformational, not transactional. Now, what do I mean by that? Simply coming to church on a Sabbath is not the intention of the Sabbath. For a man or a woman to keep the Sabbath for 80 years and still be the same, that's not God's plan. The Sabbath has always been the thing that's supposed to be helping us through the process of transformation. 
true Sabbath keeping is transformational. So the 144,000, something interesting about this group now, is they are individuals that will fully depend upon God for holiness. They will recognize their own spiritual poverty. See, the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. We heard Sister Hanitra read for us, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. So keep this in mind. Now, let's, let's move on to Revelation 14, verse 1. We now want to ask the question, well, what is this seal that protects? So I kind of just jumped in, brought in the Sabbath a little bit, but let's figure it out from the Scriptures. So I hope you don't mind. We're doing a little study sermon type thing this morning. Revelation 14, and I want you to notice verse 1. The Bible reads, when you're there, please let me know by saying amen. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having what? His father's name written in their foreheads. Now, friends, I want you to catch this. The father's name is in the foreheads. Chapter 7, the seal must go in the foreheads. The father's name and the seal are synonymous. They're, they're together, they're, there's a relationship there. And simply put, in the Bible, what does a name represent? Character. And friends, we know that the law of God is a transcript of his character. And so you have a seal, father's name, and then you have his law. All one thing. Now go with me to Proverbs chapter 18. Let's see why is the name of God so important. Proverbs 18, and keep in mind, the law, the name of God, or the character of God, is the thing that protects you and I, because a seal protects. Proverbs 18, uh, we're going to read verse 10. When you're there, please let me know by saying amen. The Bible says, the name of the Lord is what? Strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. So, Catch this now. The name of the Lord, strong tower. That is the place of safety. Now, what is interesting is the opposite is true, or this is how you distinguish between the righteous and the unrighteous. You see, the righteous man or woman runs to the name of the Lord for safety. The unrighteous person runs to anything else other than the name of the Lord. And so we find, in fact, verse 11 tells you the rich man's wealth is his strong city. So those that run to riches, they say, oh, the, rich, the riches are my, my protection. And what is interesting now is that that difference is who you turn to in the time of trouble. Who are you turning to even right now with the little things that we face? You see, it's so easy for us to turn to people. It's so easy for us to turn to, I don't know, turn to food, turn to, to this, to that, to that. Everything and anything except Jesus. But God is waiting for a people that will be ready, that will have learned to turn to him for every single thing. So notice that God seals a people for crisis that they must go through. All right. He does not spare his people from a crisis. He seals them to go through the crisis. Okay. There are many doctrines out there which, which teach that, you know, God will spare you tribulation. My brothers and sisters, Revelation does not teach that. Now, <laughs> before we, we say, well, you know, people teach these doctrines, we can also fall under the same trap. You see, there's this thing, I call it the curse of convenience and comfort. I am not immune from that. I, I, I see it in myself all the time, and, and I, I plead with the Lord for it. But we profess not to believe the secret rapture, but yet we live life according to the secret rapture. So we live life, well, I don't want no trouble. I don't want no inconvenience. I don't want this. I don't want that. I don't want that. And God is saying, you should want my seal so that you can deal with whatever comes your way. So we say, 
I don't want to work with this individual. They give me stress. God says, that's, that's the wrong request. You should be requesting my seal so that you can deal with that situation. We say, I don't want to go to such and such a place because it's just not my, my style. God says, wrong request. We say, and, and you, know, you know what you say, you can fill, fill in the blanks, right? But the challenge here, my brothers and sisters, is God is saying, I need a people who will be ready. And if we go back to Ezekiel 9 now, let's see this emphasis on, on character. Ezekiel chapter 9, I did not emphasize it when I read it first time, but I want to emphasize it now. Ezekiel chapter 9, we're going to read verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4, when you're there, please let me know by saying amen. Amen. The Bible says, and the Lord said unto him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Two realities that are pointed out in this scripture. One of them, the sad reality that there are abominations in Jerusalem. Scripture says it. This is what happened. This is why they were destroyed by Babylon at the time. And this is why in the end as well, the same crisis. But abominations. But the second reality, I want you to notice who is sealed or who a mark is placed upon. The foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now notice uh, some definitions from the Hebrew there. The sighing and the crying, this is an expression of burden and desire for rest, sighing, groaning, or mourning, and this is continually. In fact, as I was was kind of digging into this, it's like a cow that is in the field just mooing, basically. That's the, the picture they have. Then crying is the crying out of a child or one who is helpless. So we ask ourselves, are we part of the 144,000? The first question should be, are we a candidate? Do we cry and sigh over the abominations in Jerusalem? Now, this is not the crying where I go on my YouTube page and I'm putting all the stuff and I'm just like, look, look how messed up this is. This is the kind of crying where heaven will say, I have heard your cries day in and day out. Not only for the sins of others, but for your own sins. This is what God is looking for. This is the prime candidate to be sealed. Those that sigh and cry. So notice that the 144,000 or the candidates for the 144,000, they are not indifferent to what hurts God's heart. You see, friends, oftentimes we are so carefree about what happens to God. Oftentimes. Now, I worked in a company before, and I worked in an area called research and development. And we also had quality assurance. So in research and development, you're making all these gadgets and whatever you're making, and then, you know, we want to put it out on the market. And I have before you right here, I brought two little samples. I needed to illustrate it, so I brought. Now, does anyone know what this is? My Harvard Hills friends might maybe know. (laughs) What is this? It's not a trick question. Okay, I saw one sister murmured iPhone. It's an iPhone. It's actually an iPhone 6, okay? Then (laughs) my brother says, good. Then I want you to notice this. This is also an iPhone. Now, how do you know this is an iPhone and this is an iPhone? They look alike? Okay. How about I bring this and say, well, this is an iPhone. This does not look like this one. How do you know this is an iPhone? Function? And the name? Okay, all right, okay. Now, what is interesting is if you turn this little phone around, they have this little Apple-type thing on there, okay, which is the seal of Apple. Now, in quality assurance, they would not put or we would not put a seal on anything until it has been tested and proved and basically the company is sure that we can send it out onto the market and we are sure of that product. So by the time you hold one of these, 
Apple is simply saying, well, we, we've tested, we've tried it, and we think that it will go and we have no problems with it. That's what they're saying. <laughs> Except a recall, right? Now, I want you to, to think this in mind now when it comes to the seal of God. God is simply saying, in order to seal something, it's first going to need to be tested, it first needs to be tried, and then it's going to be sealed and it's ready. Ready for a storm, Brother Xavier. Ready, ready, ready. And so, again, notice they're sighing and they're crying. As I was studying this, the question that came to my heart was, Lord, do I care? Do I sincerely care? And friends, I have to be honest with you, I found myself saying, when I look at Christ, no, I don't care. And of course, we are not to stop at being overwhelmed by our, our state. We are to run to God and say, Lord, help me to care. You see, in the same book of Ezekiel, in fact, go to Ezekiel 36 real quick. Ezekiel 36, I want you to notice something interesting. Did you know primarily the Bible is written to people that would actually read the Bible? Like believers. So your atheist is not reading the Bible. Sometimes we as believers, we read the Bible and we apply it to the atheist. But God says, no, I wrote this so that you can read it and you can apply it. Now notice Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. It says, a new heart will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. Now, reading this, we would be tempted to think God is speaking to some unbelievers out there. But the context of Ezekiel 36, God is talking to Israel, his people. And God says, I want to take out the heart of stone. The heart that does not feel anything. It's pricked and pricked and pricked, but it's just solid stone, doesn't feel anything. The heart that can watch a saint depart from the Lord and just say, well, they left the Lord, that's, that's them. Go back to eating our tofu sandwiches. And God says, I want to put a heart of flesh. Flesh, you, you, take, you take something and just prick, prick your skin next time and see what happens. You feel it. God says, that's the kind of heart I want to put. The heart that will sigh, the heart that will cry over the abominations. That will cry sincerely. And so notice that the distinguishing mark in Revelation, also shown in Ezekiel, is actually character. The character of the people. And so simply put, the 144,000, put it up on the screen. In fact, Father's name, sorry, I kind of jumped this. The Father's name, we're simply told God is love. The Bible tells us that then we know in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's going to describe for us practically what love is. Then in Exodus, we are told love, or basically God, his character, he's merciful, he's gracious, he's long-suffering, he's abundant in goodness. All these things God wants to write in the hearts of his people. So imagine being merciful. Imagine being so gracious. Imagine being so long-suffering that with Jesus in the vessel, you can smile at the storm. And simply put, the candidates for the 100 or the 144,000 will be the kindest, the most loving people planet Earth will have ever seen outside of Christ, right? They will have joy. They will have peace. They will have patience. They will be gentle, they will be meek, and they will be temperate in all things. They will be steadfast to withstand any trial. And they will be the most effective soul winners that this world has ever seen outside of Christ. This, my friends, is what God is doing. And notice it's his character he wants to put. Now, interestingly enough, let me, let me just pause a little bit there. We are told in, in Messages to Young People, 92, paragraph 1, the thoughts and feelings combined make up moral character. So imagine God wants his thoughts in your mind. God wants his feelings in your mind. In Isaiah, God says, your thoughts 
are not my thoughts. And so we find the 144,000 candidates are people that are willing to surrender their own ways and embrace God's ways. There are people that realize that the way I think is not necessarily the way God thinks. And I need a change, but only God can change it. So how do we develop character? Let's go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Just want to look at how is it that God seeks to develop this character or to prepare a people that will be sealed, a people that will stand through the final crisis. James chapter 1. When you're there, let me know by saying amen. I'm reading verse 2 to verse 4. The Bible says, my brethren, count it all what? (laughs) Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Notice that it is the trying of our faith that actually is being used to develop character. Now, I found this very, very interesting. Last night, uh, my wife thought it was 3 a.m. I thought it was 5 a.m. It was probably closer to 6 a.m. But our young son, 11-month-old son, he woke up at that time. And, and you know, as he wakes up, you know, he's not just going to stay quiet. He wants everyone else to wake up. So as, as we are wrestling with this, this is particularly a trial, not just for my wife, but for me as well, especially knowing that I'm coming to stand before you this morning. But what is interesting is James says, count it all joy. Mothers and fathers, James is saying, count it all joy when your young child wakes up in the middle of the night because that is training you to be able to wake up in the darkest hour of this world's history. The Bible is saying that work colleague that brings out those elements in you that you may not appreciate, the Bible is saying count it all joy because that is supposed to be working patience in you. Count it all joy is what God is saying. There is a counsel that was given to um, a lady called Sydney Brownsberger. She was given counsel by Ellen White. Uh, She was described as being self-centered and this is what that counsel said. This is from Daughters of God 170, paragraph 1. It says, your wishes, your will, will often be crossed, but you should not be discouraged. Jesus loves you, and he wants you to be happy even in this life and to be a light in the world. I wish you could see and our people could see what they may be and what they may become. God will will work with your efforts. Tests will come to us daily in trials and disappointments. So notice, trials and disappointments. And the true character is developed. So I want you to notice, trials, disappointments, develops true character. Then those who cannot endure the vexations and crosses of life will utterly fail when the sterner trials shall be open upon them. Jesus wants you to be happy, but you cannot be happy in having your own way and following the impulse of your own heart. So notice, in God's wisdom, God says, no, 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 you having your own way actually will not lead you to happiness. It will lead you to death. And God says, I need to prepare you. There is a work of preparation that needs to take place. So I want us to go to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to illustrate this with a story and um, and then draw to to a conclusion on this part. Matthew chapter 8, interesting enough, this is a story which Xavier used in his children's story. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23 to verse 27. And as he was telling that story, for me it was confirmation from the Lord that that was the story that needed to be told. Uh, And so I, I praise the Lord for that. Matthew chapter 8, 23 to 27, notice we're going to look at a group of individuals. We have Jesus, we have the disciples. Jesus is the embodiment of someone who is sealed in a crisis. Notice, and when the disciples entered into the ship, he, sorry, and when he was entered into, the, into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, in so much that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. So notice, a storm on the sea, the winds are literally what cause a storm. 
And so imagine the winds are buttering the ship and, and it's being tossed everywhere. And keep in mind, the disciples, at least five of them, are experienced fishermen. They have experience at sea. But notice verse 25. And, the, and his disciples came to him and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye so fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? I want you to notice the two reactions. The reaction of Jesus, who is sealed. And the reaction of the disciples who are being prepared for to be sealed later on. The disciples' priority is, save me. Self. We perish. Jesus' priority was, why are you demonstrating a lack of faith in God? Why? Through the crisis. You see, crisis will reveal what's already inside. It doesn't put anything in. Now, there is an interesting thing that happened. So in the year 2020, we had COVID, and there was this article that came out in Christianity Today, which was speaking of an incident that happened in 1527 with Martin Luther. So in 1527, and this, the title, as you see there, What Martin Luther Teaches Us About Coronavirus. How many of us would agree COVID was a crisis, a storm that came upon this world? Now, interesting, in 1527, less than 200 years after the Black Death had wiped out almost half of the population of Europe. In 1527, the Black Death came back again in Wittenberg, which was the place where Luther lived. Now, what is interesting is Luther, at a time when everyone, remember crisis, at a time when everyone was fleeing Wittenberg, they're like, look, Black Death is back. I'm out of here. I don't want to die. I'm gone. Luther was appealing to the people, stay. And I'm going to read for you an excerpt of what Luther was saying. First, Luther argued that anyone who stands in a relationship of service to another has a vocational commitment not to flee. Those in ministry, he wrote, must remain steadfast before the peril of death. The sick and dying need a good shepherd who will strengthen and comfort them and administer the sacraments. He was still Catholic, I guess. Lest they be denied the Eucharist before their passing. Public officials, including mayors and judges, are to stay and maintain civil order. Public servants, including city-sponsored physicians and police officers, must continue their professional duties. Even parents and guardians have vocational duties towards their children. Luther was pleading with the people. He pled with fellow Christians, you cannot leave when there is a crisis. That is when you're actually needed. Many left. Luther stayed. Luther went to the homes of the people, gave them hydrotherapy. Luther ministered to them. Luther helped them become well. 493 years later, when COVID hits, some of the world were looking at Luther's example and saying, wow, what was it that this man did? Now, the question I would ask is, if the Lord was to allow a couple of more years, could this be written of us as was written of Luther? In the crisis hour, did we react like a people that were unsealed or people that were sealed? You see, my brothers and sisters, crisis is always an opportunity for God to be seen. And I hazard a guess that we missed a big opportunity. That the world should have been saying, these are a wise people. Truly, they serve a wise God. Opportunity missed. So preparation is necessary. I want you to notice this. A warning for God's people. Many will not receive the seal of God because they do not keep his commandments or bear the fruits of righteousness. So two aspects, the keeping of the commandments and the bearing fruit. Notice that I say the knowing of the commandments, the keeping of the commandments. Then it says, our own course of action will determine whether we shall receive the seal of the living God or be cut down by the destroying weapons. So again, it's in our hands. 
God says, my angels are holding. I'm trying to prepare a people. Will you be prepared? Now I want you to turn to our scripture reading, Philippians chapter 1. We need to, to draw to a close. Philippians chapter 1. And then we'll share a story. There's something very interesting about Philippians chapter 1 I want you to see. When you're there, please let me know by saying amen. amen. Philippians chapter 1. I opened the wrong thing. And verse 6, let's read it together, church. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now pause and meditate on that promise. You are to be confident in the fact that he which has begun a good work in you will complete it. But who is it that is working? Christ, right? And who is it that, is, that should be cooperating? <laughs> you and I, right? Now, I want you to notice something interesting. God has shown us how he works. And we're going to look back at creation. So remember creation, we have seven days. Day one, day two, all up to day seven. And what's interesting is on day seven, God seals his creation. He puts his mark, just like Apple puts their little thing. There's nothing new under the sun. They put their logo. God's logo is the Sabbath. He put the Sabbath as his seal. Now, let's do a little refresher quiz. On day number one, what did God make? Okay, the light, right? And children, please help me. I know you have a song. So day number one, God makes light. Day number two? Okay. The bodies of water are separated, the heavens and, and basically the seas. Okay. And day number three? The earth and vegetation. Thank you. Day number four? Okay. Sun, moon, and stars. Day number five? Okay, the birds and the sea creatures. All right, okay, please, Seventh-day Adventists, let's, let's bring out our creation knowledge. Day number six, man and animals. Okay, and day number seven, this one you should all know, please. Okay, the Sabbath, right? So I want you to notice this. Light, sky, and seas, land and vegetation, sun, moon, birds, all these things. Now keep in mind, creation, God shows us how he works. If you open Genesis chapter 1 later today, you will notice day number 1, evening and morning. Day number 2, evening and morning. Day number 3, evening and morning. And all these things. But only on the seventh day does it say God rested. Day number 1, it doesn't say God rested. Day number 2, it doesn't say God rested. Because God only rests when he has finished his work. Being confident of this very thing, the God who started a work will not rest until it is done. It is perfect in his eyes, right? But what is interesting in creation, same thing for, for um, recreation, the first three days God was forming. So God, light, God makes the sky and the seas, God makes the land and the vegetation. The next three days, God starts filling what he's already formed. And so you find, for example, day number five, the birds and the sea creatures, guess what? He had already prepared the sky and the sea. Day number six, the animals and the man, you imagine God says, okay, I'm going to make animals, but there's no place for them. So now you understand why Jesus says, I go now to prepare a place. So I prepare a place, but then I am going to fill that place. Now in recreation, my brothers and sisters, the question now is, is God forming me? into his likeness? Am I allowing God to fill me with his spirit? Because when God forms, when God fills, God will seal. But God will not seal something that God says that is not up to the standard that I want. And so the appeal this morning is simple. Let him work. Put down your weapons of resistance. Let him work. Let him do what he needs to do to prepare you for what is ahead. Because my brothers and sisters, God is saying there is something serious coming. Now, I want you to notice, I'm going to share a quick story in closing. This is a story of a man called Hiru Onada. I hope I said it correctly. I'm not Japanese. 
Now, Hiru was actually an imperial Japanese army officer, okay? Now, he refused for 29 years to believe that World War II was over, for 29 years. Now, this man, he was sent to the Philippines in 1944, and the last order that was given him when he was sent was to keep fighting until further orders come. So that's what this man did. Keep fighting until further orders come. And so after Japan surrendered, Onada and several others who had been trained in guerrilla tactics remained hidden in Lubang Island. They built bamboo huts, they stole food from villages, they patched their uniforms, and they kept their guns in working order for 29 years. Leaflets were dropped from planes explaining that the war was ended. But Onada and his comrades believed it was enemy propaganda. So they saw it, they're like, nah, we, we're fighting. Last orders were keep fighting until you receive a new set of orders. They continued to evade search parties until one day the men died or surrendered. Not until 1974 did Lieutenant Onada change his mind. It took a delegation from the Japanese government and his own brother to finally convince him to lay down his weapons. 29 years. The man would not change his mind. Now, my brothers and sisters, it is very interesting that God is also sending message after message after message. God is sending messages to his people saying, the war Christ has conquered Put down your carnal weapons. Put away the finger. Put away anything that would cause you unnecessary death. And unfortunately, friends, many like Hiro Onada are saying, nah, I'll keep doing it my way. I'll keep going. Now, the flip side of it, God is also looking for Hiru Onadas, called the 144,000, that will not deviate until a small cloud appears in the eastern sky. And so the appeal is simple. Who will say, Lord, having looked at what we've looked at this morning, I recognize that the question is not, am I a part of the 144,000? The question is, can I become a candidate today? Can I allow you to work in me? Change my heart and let it be truly yours. Help me to begin preparing. There's a serious preparation. We are told God's seal will not be placed on any whose character is still faulty. But God wants access to be able to work. So I'm going to invite the choristers to come up. As they come up, uh, as we prepare to sing our closing hymn, I am going to make a very direct, distinct appeal. And as we are singing, if it applies to you, then I want to invite you to come up, and uh, we will pray at the end of our singing. So my appeal is this. Maybe you are saying I am like Hiru, the negative aspect of it. I'm still fighting battles which I was conditioned to fight, and it hasn't gotten me anywhere. But I realize that now it's time to surrender and to yield my life to Christ. Maybe you've not even taken a step in baptism and you're simply saying I want to start preparations for baptism. Because a storm is coming. But I don't want to do that because a storm is coming. I want to do it because I realize that God has loved me so much that he's put everything on hold just for me to be ready. And so if that is you, then as we sing towards the end, I'm going to invite you to, to come up. And along with that, I also want to appeal to those that... Yes, I've been in the movement for so long. Yes, I'm part of the movement. Yes, I've, I've, I've kept so many Sabbaths. But the reality is, I am still unchanged. I am like the Medes and the Persians. I do not change. I am in the body, but I am so headstrong with my own ways. And you're simply saying, Lord, I want to lay down my weapons. 
help me. So as we sing, I'll invite you to come up. Our closing hymn is 279, Only Trust Him. such a merciful God, for being a God that wants to take us, people that you made out of dirt, and to put your name in us, Lord. We thank you because that is a privilege that I don't think we fully comprehend. And so as we are before you right now, Father, we are simply pleading that you would take our hearts that you would transform them, that you would give us this heart of flesh that you are so willing to give. We ask for forgiveness, dear God, where we have just been slow or indifferent to you, Lord. You have sent message after message after message and we've just become so casual and so used to that. 
But I pray, Lord, that we may find ourselves becoming a people that are more prayerful, a people that are more studious, a people that will care for souls. Let it not be said of us, Lord, in the end, depart from me. I knew you not. Father, let it not be said by Christ that where were you when I had COVID? Where were you when I was struggling? Where were you when this was happening? But let it be that we may have your heart. We may have your character. We may want to see your name uplifted in everything that we do. So, Father, I bring before you my brothers and sisters who have come forward. You know what each one is going through. You know the deep cries of each heart that is before you. And only you are able to make holy. Only you are able to restore. Only you are able, Lord, to lift up and to, to get those eyes fixed upon Christ, who is the only solution we have. And so I pray, Lord, that you will do a special work for each one, that you would answer the cry of their heart. And let it be that their heart will be united with your heart, Lord. And so, Father, we thank you. Thank you that you will have a group that will go through the final crisis and that will be victorious over the beasts and over his mark and anything else that is thrown at them. But we thank you most importantly that you have promised that you will never leave us or forsake us. And so, Lord, we are saying, please work unhindered. Bring your work to fruition. Help us not to resist the workings of your Spirit. And ultimately, Father, please, as you form us, we pray, please fill us with your Spirit. And as you fill us, Lord, seal us, dear God, and help us not to waver or to change. Seal the decisions that have been made today, Father. Let them be secure in your hands. We thank you, and we ask these mercies in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.